I want to talk about information more about something that happened at my college two years ago, which has started a, a major movement that actually affects precisely the issues that Jack raised about class and race and education at a very important turning point, I think, in the overall structure of education um, in college. And I think eventually what's going on in the college case can trickle down all the way down to elementary school. So I think this is a, a real big turning point. So um, I tend to like to use um, boards if this work or works. So I am actually at San Jose State uh, University. Now, I teach in the philosophy department. Um, and we're a, you know, we're a pretty large you know, state university. I know someone mentioned they were at Chico before, similar size. And we were interacting across uh, a nexus between our small university and a cluster of very large, highly funded private universities like Harvard. like Stanford, and like MIT. These are great schools. I'm not saying anything negative about them. But we were interacting with them across a very large nexus. And so this is the story. I'm going to tell you the story of what happened, how that led to uh, a major event at our university, and how that impacts education. Uh, and eventually, I'll sort of tie it into some of the issues that I think are coming forward and are going to impact education in a very serious way. So basically, I am a philosophy professor, and I teach basically business ethics, philosophy of economics, applied ethics, critical thinking, things like that. And I was approached by my university to run an experiment where basically a professor at the Harvard Political Science Department named Michael Sandel, who some of you may know, he's a very famous professor, who's written many books on justice and teaches a very, very famous course called Justice at Harvard University. And I was asked by my university if I wanted to participate in uh, a massive open online course, which would basically use the content of the live course that Michael Sandel teaches at Harvard. And I would basically teach his course in my classroom and sit there and sort of present his material or sit in the audience and watch my students watch a video and then sort of engage with them. And one of the ideas that was being used is that this will be a way in which we get high quality content material to another school and we improve education for the people at that school and we can take more time in the classroom to engage the student rather than lecturing. So in some sense, I would no longer lecture my students. Michael Sandel would lecture my students and I would then engage my students. And so I was approached by my university to do this because this was the birth a couple years ago of massive open online courses and a new movement which was going to basically bring education from high quality universities to lower universities and lower costs. We'll get to that part a little bit later, but there's a lot of things that they wanted to sell it based on, but first the story. So basically they came up to me and you know, I'm an open-minded person and I'm not against technology and education at all, so I basically said yes. I said, you know, I, I think I'll go do this. It sounds like a good idea. And then because I am in a department with very wise people like Rita Manning and Corinne Brown, Carlos Sanchez, Peter Hadrius, I spoke to them and I asked them, is this a good idea? Should we be doing this? Uh, should I be doing this you know, to help out the university and test out these new ideas? And they said, hmm, sounds like it could be good. But then after a little while, they're like, wait a minute, this is crazy. This is ridiculous. And we decided to get together and have a meeting and talk amongst ourselves as philosophers and political scientists and people who understand race, class, and social issues, and the consequences of technology, and philosophy of economics, and important issues. And we came to the conclusion that this was absolutely problematic. And it was problematic in so many ways that, in fact, it was ironic. It was crazy. And um, mind you, I want you to keep in mind that the course that I was being asked to teach was a course on social justice. What do you teach in class on social justice? You teach theories of justice, and you teach how to apply them to specific problems, like sweatshop labor, for example. Okay? That's what you do in a course like this. So we basically sat together over the course of two weeks, and we decided, you know, we're going to just write a letter to the Chronicle of Higher Education, and we're going to tell them what we think about this, because we've been asked to do something that we think is quite problematic. So I'm now going to read you the letter that we wrote, which has now gained a lot of attention. So it is addressed to Professor Sandel, but I don't want to pick him out as a person who's done anything specifically wrong, because obviously someone approached him and said, hey, you ought to do this, and we'll sell that over there. And maybe he wasn't thinking so critically at the moment they approached him. But nevertheless, let's, the letter is addressed to him. 
Dear Professor Sandel, San Jose State University recently announced a contract with edX, a company associated with MIT and Harvard, to expand the use of online blended courses. The SJSU philosophy department was asked to pilot your Justice X course, and we refused. We decided to express to you our reasons for refusing to be involved with this course, and because we believe that other departments and universities will sooner or later face the same predicament, we have decided to share our reasons with you publicly. There is no pedagogical problem, no pedagogical problem in our department that Justice X solves, nor do we have a shortage of faculty capable of teaching our equivalent course. We believe that long-term financial considerations motivate the call for massively open online course, MOOCs, at public universities such as ours. Unfortunately, the move to MOOCs comes at great peril to our university. We regard such courses as a serious compromise of quality of education, and ironically, for a social justice course, a case of social injustice. What are the essential components of a good quality education in a university? First, one of the most important aspects of being a university professor is scholarship in one specialization. Students benefit enormously from interaction with professors engaged in such research. The students not only have a teacher who is passionate, engaged, and current on the topic, but in classes, independent <coughs> studies, and in informal interaction, they are provided with provided the opportunity to engage a topic deeply, thoroughly, and analytically in a dynamic and up-to-date fashion. A social justice course needs to be current since part of its mission is the application of conceptions of justice to existing social issues. In addition to providing students with an opportunity to engage with active scholars, expertise in the physical classroom, sensitivity to its diversity, and familiarity with one's own students are simply not available in a one-size-fits-all blended course produced by an outside vendor. Second, of late, we have been hearing quite a bit of criticism of the traditional lecture model as a mismatch for today's digital generation. Anut Agrawal, edX president, has described the standard professor as basically just pontificating and spouting content, a description he used 10 times in a recent press conference here at SJSU. Of course, since philosophy has traditionally been taught using the Socratic method, we are largely in agreement as to the inadequacy of lecture alone, but after all, the rhetoric questioning the effectiveness of the antiquated method of lecturing and note-taking, it is telling to discover that the core of edX's Justice X is a series of videotaped lectures that include excerpts of Harvard students making comments and taking notes. In spite of our administration for your ability to lecture in such an engaging way to such a large audience, we believe that having a scholar teach and engage his or her own students in person is far superior to having those students watch a video of another scholar engaging his or her students. Indeed, the videos of you lecturing to and interacting with your students is itself a compelling testament to the value of the in-person lecture and discussion. In addition, purchasing a series of lectures does not provide anything over and above assigning a book to read. We do, of course, respect your work in political philosophy. Nevertheless, having our students read a variety of texts, perhaps including your own, is far superior to having them listen to your lectures. This is especially important for a digital generation that reads far too little. If we can do something as educators, we would like to increase literacy, not decrease it. <laughs> Third, the thought of the exact same social justice course. This paragraph I absolutely love. Third, the thought of the exact same social justice course being taught in various philosophy departments across the country is downright scary, something out of a dystopian novel. Departments across the country possess unique specializations and character and should stay that way. Universities tend not to hire their own graduates for a reason. They seek different influences. Diversity in schools of thought and plurality of points of view are at the heart of a liberal education. What would our students learn about justice through a purchase blended course from a private vendor? First, what kind of message are we sending our students if we tell them that they should best learn what justice is by listening to the reflections of the largely white student population from a privileged institution like Harvard. Our very diverse students gain far more when their own experience is central to the course and when they are learning from our own very diverse faculty who bring their varied perspectives to the content of courses that bear on social justice. Second, should one size fit all vendor design blended courses become the norm, we fear that two classes of universities will be created. One, well-funded colleges and universities in which privileged students get their own real professor, and other, financially stressed private and public universities in which students watch a bunch of videotape lectures and interact, if ne indeed any interaction is available on their home campuses with the professor that this model of education has turned into a glorified teaching assistant. Public universities will no longer provide the same quality of education and will not remain on par with well-funded private ones. 
Teaching justice through an educational model that is spearheading the creation of two social classes in academia thus amounts to a cruel joke. Can technology be used to improve education? Absolutely. Blended courses provide the opportunity to listen to lectures for a second or third time and enable class discussion sessions outside the usual constraints of time and space. For these very reasons, many of the faculty in our own department offer very high quality online and blended versions of a number of our offerings, including videotaped material we ourselves have developed. All of these offerings are continuously updated and their use includes extensive interaction among students. In addition, they also involve extensive interaction with the professor teaching the course, something that is not available in MOOCs, which rely on videotape lectures, canned exercises, and automated and peer grading. When a university such as ours purchases a course from an outside vendor, the faculty cannot control the design or the content of the course. Therefore, we cannot develop and teach content that fits with our overall curriculum and is based on both our own highly developed and continuously renewed competence and our direct experience of our students' needs and abilities. In the short term, we might be able to preserve our close contact with our students, but given the financial motivations driving the move to MOOCs, the prognosis for the long term is grim. The use of technology, has his, as history shows, can improve or worsen the quality of education, but in a high quality course, the professor teaching it must be able to both design the course and to choose its materials, and to interact closely with the students. The first option is not available in the prepackaged course, and the second option is at grave risk if we move towards MOOCs. It's time to call it like it is. We believe the purchasing of online and blended courses is not driven by concerns about pedagogy, but by an effort to restructure the U.S. university system in general and our own California State University system in particular. If the concern was pedagogically motivated, we would expect faculty to be consulted and to monitor quality control. On the other hand, when change is financially driven and involves a compromise of quality, it is done quickly without consulting faculty or curriculum committees and behind closed doors. This is essentially what happened with SJSU's contract with edX. At a press conference April 10, 2013, announcing the signing of the contract with edX, California Lieutenant Governor Gavin Newsom acknowledged as much. The old education financial model, frankly, is no longer sustainable. This is the crux of the problem. It is time to stop masking the real issue of MOOCs and blended courses behind empty rhetoric about a generation and a new world. The purchasing of MOOCs and blended courses from outside vendors is the first step towards restructuring the CSU system. Good quality online courses and blended courses to which we have no objections do not save money, but purchased prepackaged ones do, and a lot. With prepackaged MOOCs and blended courses, faculty ultimately not needed, a teaching assistant would suffice to facilitate a blended course, and one might argue paying a university professor just to monitor someone else's material would be a waste of resources. Public universities that have so long successfully served the students and citizens of California will be dismantled, and what remains of them will become a hodgepodge branch of private companies. Administrators of the CSU say they do not see a choice. They are trying to admit and, trying to admit and graduate as many students as they can with insufficient funds. Whether they are right in complying with, rather, complying with rather than resisting this, the discussion has to be honest and to the point. Let's not kid ourselves. Administrators at the CSU are beginning a process of replacing faculty with cheap online education. In our case, we had better be sure that this is what we want to do because once the CSU or any university system is restructured in this way, it will never recover. Industry is demanding that public universities devote their resources to providing ready-made employees, while at the same time they are resisting paying the taxes that support public education. California is the ninth largest economy in the world, yet has one of the most poorly supported publication edu public education systems in the nation. Given these twin threats, the liberal arts are under renewed attack in public universities. We believe that education in a democracy must be focused on responsible citizenship and general education courses in the liberal arts are crucial to such education. The move to outside vendor MOOCs is especially troubling in light of this. It is hard to see how they can nourish the complex mix of information, attitude, solidarity, and moral commitment that are crucial to flourishing democracies. We respect your desire to expand opportunities for higher education to audiences that do not now have the chance to interact with these new ideas. We are very cognizant of your long and distinguished record of scholarship and teaching in the areas of political philosophy and ethics. It is in the spirit of respect and collegiality that we are urging you and all professors involved with the sale and promotion of edX style courses not to take away from students in public universities the opportunity for education beyond mere jobs training. 
professors who care about public education should not produce products that will replace professors, dismantle departments, and provide a diminished education for students in public universities. So this letter was written in, in a democratic process of the members of the philosophy department at San Jose State University, sent to the Chronicle of Higher Education, and we called it a day thinking, okay, we, we'd set our piece. We kind of think we made a good point. We may echo points that I think very many of you would say we definitely hit a, a nerve, I think, that's very important on the class race boundary in education, which I'll talk a little bit more about. Uh, the response to this letter was astronomical. The New York Times picked it up right away. The Guardian picked it up in the UK. It was in Australia also. We got hundreds of responses from small universities around America saying, oh my God, we feel the same pressure. Administrators are constantly telling us to adopt massive online open courses. We're getting a lot of pressure. How do we resist this? And we started an organization at our own university about uh, students for quality education with faculty where we're now promoting sort of fighting this battle about the introduction of MOOCs. And I think it's a big, a big thing because the rhetoric that's behind it, so I want to talk about like a larger rhetoric, is access and affordability. So let's, let's talk a little bit about access and affordability and how that intersects with class, class and race in an important way. It's true that probably by having courses like this, you can educate people outside of the United States in countries where there are very limited resources for teachers. But the one thing that's very interesting about the way in which we present this access affordability thing internationally, not just domestically, but internationally, is that we say, by having these courses, people in certain other countries can get a high quality education from MIT. Question, if you're going to get an education from MIT through a massive open online course, and you live in sub-Saharan Africa in a small village, what do you need to get that education? A what? Internet. Yeah, or what el and what else? Computer. Right. Are they going to provide them with the computers? No, they're not, right? So you're going to put all this money into making all these MIT and Harvard courses accessible. But the people on the other side, they need the computer. They don't have a computer. They don't have reliable internet. They don't have reliable systems in general. One second. Let me just finish. So if you're going to package A as a solution, please bring B along with it. And in some cases, I think they do want to bring B along with it. But the sale of access and affordability to all these people with this idea that it's going to revolutionize things without putting the B alongside of it is just, it just seems absurd to me. And I watch over and over this rhetoric about how it's going to be able to do so much. But it's just so obvious that if kids need to take notes with the pad, even, you need to give them a pad, right? It's true in every case, right? It's not just about computers. It's about providing the re relevant tools required to get the right type of education. So I do think that there is something on the access affordability side that's important. Now, there's another issue here that ties in, which is the quality issue. So some people have been arguing that, well, you want to say that when a professor is standing there in the classroom, that the quality is better than a computer. And there are a number of ways in which they try to combat that. Well, computers don't get sick. Professors get sick. There's one, there's one simple counterexample that they always push. OK, you know, uh, we can design computers to have an algorithm where 90% of the questions that the students will ask can be answered by the algorithm. So this is an interesting idea. So let's explore this critically. It might actually be true that in some classes this works. Okay? So for example, I'll talk about two different classes I teach. I teach a class in formal logic. right? And there is actually good software out there that can say, look, the student made this mistake at this sequence in a proof. The probability that they made this mistake was because of this error. We can program the algorithm to then cook up a special test case where they then solve that problem, then give them another problem. They'll solve that one. If they get it, then that was obviously the problem. We'll move forward, right? And we have a battery of things. And I actually helped design this with the company. So I actually think in some cases, it can work, OK? There is some sort of areas in which you can design algorithms. Either. But if it works in those cases, why do we want to generalize and say it works in all of those cases? So when I'm teaching a class on social justice, for example, there's something that's very important about the population of students I'm teaching that's just not present in the formal logic case. What is that? It's people's independent judgments about what counts as being just in a given situation, right? And so this rhetoric about watching Michael Sandel teach students at Harvard in this interactive Socratic way is interesting because what he's doing is he's playing off of the responses that his student population gives him in order to educate them about the nature of justice and its applications in diverse situations. But that pool of students is representative of a certain subset sample of the total students we have. And if we look at my students, they're just drastically different. 
their thoughts about whether or not it's unjust to give Johnny a ball after you lost it playing baseball may be drastically different than the students who are in his sample. So you can't cook up an algorithm to get that diversity distinction going. So to apply this model in all classes just seems absurd. It seems like you're not even paying attention to the kind of content that you're teaching, right? So you can be totally in favor of MOOCs in certain cases, in the quality. You can say it actually works well in certain cases, but you shouldn't generalize from there at all. And that just seems obvious. I don't understand what is possibly going on with the people designing this stuff so that they could think that that would obviously hold to be true. But now let's go further. Let's take the actual case in which they think it works and they did try to do it. They tried to do it at statistics at San Jose State University. They said, okay, we will run a pilot study with, uh, I believe it was Udacity or Coursera out of Stanford at San Jose State, and we will test whether or not we can improve performance in students through a blue, MOOC or a blended course. It was a failure. It was absolutely a failure. Students did work, right? So there's something else going on other than just being in front of the computer and having the high quality content. They also found out that there's a high attrition rate. So a lot of people who sign up to take MOOCs just drop out. There's like no real incentive to stay involved. They also found out that in the class of those people who do take them, the ones who are successful and actually do want to continue, they already have a college degree. So, right, so the people who benefit the most from it are the people who need it the least and who already had the right education in order to allow them to function in that environment. And what do you think the kind of education they had was? It was one with a live teacher who was teaching them. So it's backwards altogether. I mean, we want to pri provide the affordability and the accessibility to the people who need it the most, right? But the whole thing seems designed in a lot of cases to completely miss that band. And that's a big problem, right? So if we are going to talk about this sort of interaction of how to improve education, this sort of model needs to be adjusted in a drastically different way in order to do this. And just sort of like, because I'd rather take more questions than just continue going on, I, I think one of the things that is, um, is important here is, um, yeah, let me, uh, let me, how can I put this? Um, yeah, let me, let me put it in a historical perspective. One time you had bank tellers, right? Now you have an ATM, right? Correct? Right? So in some sense, they want to make education automated teller machines, automated teaching machines, right? You want this sort of thing. And there's a sense in which I feel really deeply like it was good to go to the bank and interact with the bank teller, and, and I really don't like ATMs, and I think there's something valuable there, even though they think that the increase in efficiency is a reason not to have bank tellers, perhaps, and, and sort of the cost saving. Um, in the case of education, I feel there's something deeply wrong with the idea of replacing teachers with uh, computers, because it just seems like part of the thing that I want to do in the classroom is form a relationship with my students. Now, it's not true that a computer can't facilitate that relationship, but I do believe that it can't replace it, right? So, I mean, we could go into deep questions about what Anand Vaidya thinks about the future of AI and what he thinks about human consciousness and things like that, but we'll avoid that for now. I mean, bottom line, I think there's forming a relationship with a student that allows you to have a sort of ethical relationship with them, that allows you to help them grow as a person, is something that's intrinsic to a, a real education. And it's something that all of you probably experienced in the schools you went to. But the future looks really bleak, because if this model goes forward, there will be a huge class division. To have an actual education from someone who actually sits there in a classroom of 20 people and discusses ideas that are ancient from every culture in a very engaging way with you will just not be available to the masses, right? And at least from what I remember, I, mean, I remember going to your talk uh, over the summer, you said something about the, the mission plan, the master plan, right? From what I remember, the master plan was designed specifically to provide the kind of education in California that you can get at the highest levels for everybody, right? So I can actually teach the same philosophy that I learned at a very good institution to the students I have at my population, they get the same quality education. And that was part of the master plan. But if this letter is hitting it on the head, they want to take that away. They want to basically say, you know, you can get a real political science degree at Columbia, but you know, otherwise you're just going to watch the video of the political science class at Columbia, <laughs> which is like a little bit like, what? how insulting can you be? I mean, like, okay, it's bad enough that things are cut up this way, but now you want to make it the case that we can't even get someone in the classroom I can have a real conversation with? I mean, can I phone a friend? Is it, what, what is, what's going on?